Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. We have an amazing presenter, Rohan. I will let you introduce yourself whenever you're ready. Turn on your camera. So without any further ado, you can take it away. Perfect. Hi, everybody. My name is Rohan Goswami. I'm a uh, software developer, transplant cardiologist, uh, work for Mayo Clinic, and uh, dabble a little bit in artificial intelligence and um, excited to be here to speak with everybody. Today we are talking about the optimal rate of failed human interaction and how, enhance, how we can enhance human touch with artificial intelligence in medicine. So to start off with, I kind of want to talk about how medicine and artificial intelligence are this perfect symbiosis. And this is a quote by somebody I admire very much, uh, Dr. Osler, one of the founding members of Johns Hopkins Hospital. And as you can see here, he said that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability, which I think is uh, exactly what artificial intelligence uh, and medicine have in common. And so, uh, a little bit uh, about what we're going to talk about today. We'll look at describing the current practice of medicine, uh, understanding the role of artificial intelligence currently in medicine, and then the future roles uh, and applications, provide some real world examples that I've been lucky to be a part of, and then look at forecasting the future and, and what we can do to uh, kind of uh, enhance AI's use in medicine. And so a little bit about me. I have an 18 month old and two English Bulldogs. So I'm always tired and always covered in drool. I uh, used to be a software developer uh, and designer, have some iOS products out there. Um, transplant cardiologist at Mayo Clinic here in Jacksonville, Florida. I love John Wick and anything Marvel. And uh, my dad and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro about five years ago. So I'm proud of that. So when we talk about the physician and what the physician's role is today in medicine, I think there's three buckets that kind of define where uh, the needs of a provider are and serving the needs of a patient, serving the needs of the institution, and then of course, trying to serve the needs of their own family. So uh, a provider in more sense than one, uh, looking to advise patients, help diagnose them, treat them, and then support them through their, uh, their process. Uh, looking at the institution that they work for, kind of taking the majority of it currently, documentation, administrative roles, billing, corresponding with other providers, um, helping as a surrogate decision maker, and then looking to, to research and advance the field. And then, of course, looking to serve your family, being a provider, a partner, a parent, a sibling, and a child. So th that kind of defines the role of the physician today, and uh, we'll see how maybe artificial intelligence can help augment that in the future. And so kind of looking at the, the current practice of medicine, uh, I can what we do today to a bunch of shelves uh, filled with files, even though we have electronic medical records. Um, so when we're looking at the current practice of medicine, the way I divide it is into three kind of pathways, the evaluation pathway or the initial visit where we meet the patient for the first time, understand their problem, uh, kind of parse through the data and the facts that are provided as far as family history goes. Uh, you know, what the symptoms that they're presenting with and kind of why we're seeing them. And with that, we kind of determine a potential diagnostic pathway. And that really allows us to kind of, uh, you know, set up the, the parameters for the equation, if you will. Uh, analyzing the patient and the data that we gather through lab testing, physical exam, um, and understanding based off of a number of prior experiences that physicians have had through training and through experience in real life situations, we kind of interpret that result data and try to determine the best potential probability of a treatment and a diagnosis and hopefully understand uh, what those outcomes would entail. And then in the treatment phase, we're looking at more of an observational process of utilizing our past experiences to determine how they're responding to their therapy. Um, assessing if there's a risk versus benefit aspect to the, the care that we're providing. And then at the end of the day, we always want to be able to give some sort of prognostication, predict a response, and hopefully find a cure for whatever ailment we're dealing with. And so I always like to come back to the patient. And so if we start off and think about a 35-year-old female who has a history of palpitations or heart fluttering and comes to you in the emergency room with chest tightness, um, so, you know, these are the five steps that we do every day, um, history and physical, understanding what the patient's seeing us for and examining them, 
uh, ordering and determining what testing is appropriate and needed, and then coming up with the differential diagnosis and trying to figure out you know, where they fit along the spectrum of that chest tightness diagnosis pathway. Coming up with a treatment plan and then hopefully improving their symptoms. Uh, and then if they're not admitted, then coming up with a follow-up visit plan. And so that's a very algorithmic way to look at medicine. And I think if we can adapt that and kind of uh, apply that to how we integrate with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're really gonna be able to understand how, how they blend so well together. And so when we think about linking medicine and machine learning, we have these two buckets. We have medicine that is a probabilistic science where we're looking at practical experience, clinical observations, and supplying data to the machine learning model. And then in the machine learning pathway, we're adding artificial intelligence algorithms, um, you know, neural networks and data mining in order to improve our diagnostic accuracy, recommend potentially a focus therapy, and even assess individuals in relations to large data sets, right? That's kind of the, the hallmark of what we we're able to do with, you know, a billion patient records um, and applying that to one patient. And then synthesizing that and how, how are we going to be able to augment human touch? Because at the end of the day, I don't think you're ever going to be able to replace a physician, but I think you're going to be able to augment what they do. And so maybe right now, 60% of the time that we spend is trying to figure out what's wrong with somebody and 40% of the time is with them, explaining it to them and going through their treatment plan. Maybe we can shift that curve and make it an 80-20, where 80% of the time we're with the patient, helping them understand what's going on and really providing that human touch and 20% of the time having to interpret what the machine learning systems give us. And so how do we augment that human touch? You know, The data returned from these algorithms and processes that are being developed uh, allow the clinician to evaluate and implement that into their practice, decreasing the time for diagnosis, and hopefully interacting that, in increasing that um, patient interaction. And so when we look at the timeline, my, my belief is that we need to change the way we practice medicine and using artificial intelligence and machine learning, we need to bring a pre-diagnosis kind of mindset. So I'm sure everybody in the audience has seen the movie Minority Report and talking about pre-crime. And so that's kind of how I visualize medicine and pre-diagnosis. And so kind of figuring out what we can do to diagnose patients and prevent disease progression before it's too late and the patient has a bad outcome. So if we look at 2011, that's kind of where digital assistance came about. You know, we had Siri and Cortana um, and Watson played Jeopardy in one. In 2016, we had um, DeepMind's AlphaGo beat the Go champion, uh, which was a pretty big deal. Um, in 2020, we've seen an uptick in artificial intelligence uh, in medicine and kind of coming up with broad ad adaptations of basic AI concepts that, that exist currently and coming up with proof of concepts in these niche specialties that we can hopefully expand to a general population. And one of the things that we have to be careful of in the field of medicine is um, people being able to talk the talk but not really walk the walk. And one of the things that I've encountered in my path so far has been the, the buzz around AI and using that as kind of um, meaning anything that has to do with a computer. So I think, you know, being able to assess and evaluate logistic regression models is much different than using neural networks and convalescence of multiple uh, methods to cluster diagnoses and predict outcomes. And so as we move into the future in 2022, I can see us having real AI modeling, predicting um, what's going to be happening to patients and, and kind of this omic based medical advance. And so what the omic field is, is looking at genomics or pharmacodynamics or proteomics or different processes that occur within the body that all end with the omic um, uh, phrase that allow us to gather a large amount of data and individualize and personalize medicine. And then hopefully within the next 15 years and perhaps even beyond that, we'll be able to have a customized, proactive, individual medical therapy option where we can actually do that from the comfort of your home with a tablet, uh, maybe some remote blood monitoring equipment. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in this talk as well. And so where are we now, right? We have to have a foundation to figure out where we can grow from. And so we basically do basic healthcare analysis and healthcare analytics. We perform retrospective evaluations. We have prospective research based on that. 
we are very reactive in medicine. So somebody gets sick and we treat them. Somebody has a complication, we figure out why. We haven't come to the point where we can actually evaluate and assess where patients are uh, prevented from having bad outcomes. And the other thing that we're struggling with in medicine is how do we define data protection? Who owns the data? And is there some sort of dividend sharing model that we need to come up with? Because if I go to the hospital and I give you a sample of my blood, now you have that data, but it's really because of me. And so who owns the data in that pathway? And how do we, how do we work around these, these legal issues? Um, and then coming back to the over-promising and under-delivering, uh, you know, everybody puts AI in a protocol or a research thing and thinks they're going to get accepted. And so I think it's important that we understand really what's the, the, the finesse of AI that we can apply to medicine with that advanced machine learning uh, component. And then, of course, you know, we have to be careful of people taking advantage of uh, of patients and and their health situations and making sure that we balance proprietary versus free market models you know not for profit doesn't always mean not for profit and uh, for the greater good doesn't always mean for the greater good so i think it's important that we define and understand how these pitfalls can affect how we uh, treat patients because at the end of the day we always have to come back to what's best for the patient and so our current practice timeline, it's a little bit of a busy slide, really involves how we are able to, to assess time of diagnosis and accuracy. And so when we look at time of diagnosis on the left, as you move to the right, you notice that the history and physical lab history and assessment with imaging and data all increase accuracy up to 50%, but it takes a human being about 12 to 24 hours, sometimes weeks to months to do this process. Now, if we were to apply artificial intelligence to some of this, and, and when we have use case models, we may be able to increase the, uh, the accuracy, the time to diagnosis, or the time to uh, potentially figuring out what the next steps are. And so when we look at how much the history, physical lab data, and the combined imaging data allows us to improve our accuracy, we can get upwards of 80% uh, positive predictive value uh, within a time frame of about two to four hours, uh, sometimes even less with applying uh, artificial intelligence technologies. And so we really need to think about a paradigm shift. We need to think about how we can be proactive in medicine. And what do I mean by that? So when I talk about proactive in medicine, I talk about how we're able to affect human touch by applying machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies. So on the right here, I think is really cool. It's, uh, it's a portable ultrasound um, that's the size of an iPhone. And it's by a company called Butterfly IQ. Uh, this was developed in order to help uh, improve accuracy, accuracy and diagnos diagnosis uh, of patients within the emergency room for critically ill conditions that could cause death. And so this all came about by somebody having to initially wheel a washing machine sized machine into a patient's room. And over the, de the last decade, we've now been able to, to miniaturize this technology. And the way we're able to do that is by having it learn as it's scanning and improve the diagnostic accuracy, but also uh, the processes required to build devices this small have now come to fruition. And so when we optimize medicine, it's more than just human interaction. Of course, we're gonna optimize the meaningful interactions by allowing the machine learning process to do the heavy lifting. But we're also going to change the way people are billed, the way cost affects medical care in the United States and across the world. And we're also going to hopefully with that improve outcomes by optimizing image test diagnostic accuracy. What are the labs that we maybe really need to do if you come in with X or Y condition? How can we personalize your treatment recommendations, and then also how can we predict both medical and psychosocial adverse effects uh, of treatments, of diagnosis, and of delivering bad news. And so I think about it in kind of a timeline fashion. This graph to me illustrates at the bottom, you see time in months across that axis, and then going up, you have uh, from zero to 100%. And so our current models we have multiple provider visits over a year in order to gather data as the red line increases and decreases. You see that there are um, a year time frame to get a diagnosis in this example. Now with machine learning, we've seen cases where we're actually able to decrease the amount of time for diagnosis to be reached and actually start treatment earlier. 
what that does is it decreases the amount of visits that you do need with a provider in person, but it allows us to enhance the time that you're able to provide with more meaningful data being shared between the patient and the provider. And so even though you've got three visits in this scenario, your time spent with the patient is going to be greater. Your content discussed during that time period is going to be more meaningful, and you're actually going to have an improved outcome, hopefully at the end, by optimizing treatment and seeing recovery as you do in this graph. And so when we're looking at how we can optimize the use, we have to think about proactive medicine rather than reactive medicine. We've also got to be able to translate clinical problems into the right framework to fit an artificial intelligence model. And that really requires understanding the complexities of both machine learning and the human body. And I think we need to have a synthesis of clinicians who are experts in their fields and scientists and engineers who are experts in the design of artificial intelligence systems that allow us to meld these two together to really have a positive outcome. The other thing we really need to focus on is developing processes that streamline this and normalize this for people in any type of background, in any type of socioeconomic situation and establish guidelines that help drive the care models that are developed further. We also need to consider how this is gonna change insurance practices and revenue models affecting AI. Because let's say a patient does wanna give their data to a hospital or a healthcare system. Well, maybe they should be given a cutback for that that information that they're providing that would offset some of their medical bills. So these are all things that we think about. And so in order to do that, we've got to really figure out what proof of concepts we have that can define how to apply this. And we start small. So one of the things that we've done here at Mayo Clinic is we're currently working on a project where on average Mayo Clinic receives about 300,000 kidney stones a year, which is a lot of kidney stones. And they're analyzed by hand by humans looking at um, uh, composite profiles of these stones. And so there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of double checking, there's a lot of delays in high risk stones that could be a sign of cancer, could be a sign of a really bad infection that aren't being prioritized. And it's a lot of time commitment. At the end of it, you're very fatigued and tired, much just like the guy on the screen, and the yield is overall quite low. And so what can we do and what have we done to apply machine learning to this project? And so we've taken 300,000 kidney stones. We run them to a, um, through a, a IR spectrometer and get these different waveforms. Now to a machine, the waveforms are just lines and data points and they can compare them very accurately. And so with all these lines and data points, we've developed a system that can identify an abnormal signal within the slew of normal normalcy. And so what do we do with this abnormal signal? Well, we have the machines analyze it. And so we have from 300,000, now 270,000, that are normal kidney stones. Artificial intelligence develops a predefined pathology report. It goes to the, the provider's office uh, and they give it to the patient and that's that. They have the potential of determining if it's an intermediate stone. So maybe the machine's like, oh, I'm not 100% sure if this is normal or not. So what do we do then? Well, we flag it, the physicians review it, and we determine which pile it goes into. Does it go back into the green arrow bucket where it's just a normally generated report or does it need some further analysis? And then on the right, we have the high-risk kidney stones, which we've now streamlined and pulled out. And so from 300,000 being reviewed by a human eye, we've come down to between 28 to 2,000, which is a pretty big jump. And those 2000s that are higher risk that are screened early on now get to a physician or a lab technician much sooner. And that allows us to review that data to determine, is it a problem? And if it is a problem, have a discussion with the patient and come up with a plan. And so by increasing the efficiency of the system, we've actually now allowed us to optimize high risk diagnosis to be seen up front, allows us more time with the patient, and then also provides us the ability to kind of come up with a prognostication um, much sooner than we've been able to do. And so the future, where do we go from here? What are the systems that we can develop? And so this is kind of where I'm a little bit in the cloud and really optimistic about where we can go. And I'm really, uh, really passionate about how we can change the system uh, to improve medical care 
all over the world. And I think we've got to start with the individual. So we start with the individual, we get an analysis of their blood, we're able to get these omic data sets of genes and uh, proteins and metabolism, and really look and understand what that means in a larger data set comparison. By doing that, we're able to develop from a symptom what lab tests should be run, what lab tests should it be compared to, and what are the diagnostic trees uh, that we come up with. From that diagnostic tree, then we now use that basis of a physician's knowledge or a provider's knowledge to sit with the patient and to really synthesize that information to understand how it can affect that individual, how we can come up with further diagnostic trees, and how we can really treat the patient based off of a symptom that's now compared to 100 200,000 records for that one specific diagnosis, or at Mayo Clinic, we have about 2 billion uh, sets of lab data that we can compare to. And so really the, the, the robust quality of the data in the future is what's going to allow us to really be able to have this pre-diagnosis uh, going into, uh, into patient care. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to also think about are, are the current and future challenges that we have. And so one thing that's really important to me is equity among the ability for us to deliver care to patients, regardless of their socioeconomic, financial, uh, or um, uh, location. And so equal access to both hardware for institutions to be able to do this kind of processing, and then that resulting in direct relationship to care. And so one of the models that I'm looking forward to developing is being able to create a centralized system where we're able to have key centers of excellence that allow us to do high resolution typing of blood work and diagnostic symptoms and come up with true predictive algorithmic states where we can apply that to a patient that doesn't live anywhere near those centers of excellence. The next thing we have to really think about is how can we translate clinical problems into AI solutions? There's not going to be a fit for every type of scenario. You're never going to be able to figure out how to artificially intelligently operate on a patient's knee when they need a re knee replacement. You're gonna need somebody to do that. You're gonna need somebody to do a heart transplant, for example. Um, maybe there are systems that will allow us to get to that point sooner and manage the post-operative care better, but you're still gonna to have to figure out which cases fit AI use the best. And then of course, we've got to look at the limits of what we can do, not only in processing power, but in implementation of software in an equitable fashion to multiple patients and providers. And we also have to figure out, you know, how will this new landscape of medicine change how we perceive the role of the provider? Are we now just somebody who interprets data and spits it back out with a plan? Or are we taking that data, applying years of medical knowledge and understanding practice patterns and trends and designing individual uh, treatment plans for personalized medicine. And I really do think that's where we're going to end up is, is, you know, this concept of concierge medicine came out about two in around the 2000s, where you had one physician that knew that patient in and out. And um, that cost a lot of money and wasn't available to everybody. And so maybe this is a way of us doing that for the masses. The other thing we have to think about is, you know, everybody thinks about Skynet when I talk about AI. And we have to worry about uh, new roles for providers in building trust with patients. And, and that's going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and of course, time to do all of this in. So kind of summarizing all of that, looking to maybe have one blood test give us a huge amount of data and then individually treat the patient, all has to come together to building trust translating clinical problems and then developing broadly applicable models. Hopefully with that, we can have continued um, progress towards uh, a proactive medical practice. Uh, and with that, allow us as providers to increase our human connection with the patient. Um, and so with that, I uh, thank you for my time. That's my lovely daughter, Zuri, my bulldog, Maddie Joe at the top and Daisy May at the bottom, trying to get some pizza from her in the patio. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Uh, look forward to, to taking questions and uh, meeting you guys in person one day. Thank you so much, Rohan. A big virtual round of applause for Rohan, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. That was great. Um, if you're watching this, stick around, do some networking. We have more content coming, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.